Welcome to Brussels, First Minister. You've been sitting down with EU Chief Brexit negotiator Mr Barnier today. What exactly did you have to say to him? Well, the reason for meeting Mr Barnier this morning was to you know, develop a, an up-to-date understanding of the European Union's position. Um, he obviously the, the details of the meeting were private between us, but you know I left that meeting um, as I went into it with a very clear sense of what the European Commission has been saying publicly that there is no appetite here to reopen the withdrawal agreement and an extension beyond the 31st of October for the UK would really have to be predicated on some further process, a, another referendum or a general election. And you know that really underlines my determination to work with others in the UK to try to bring about another referendum so that we can avert uh, the po possibility of a no-deal Brexit or indeed any Brexit at all, given the damage that I think it will do. Do you find that bureaucrats here in Brussels sympathise with the case for a possible future Scottish independence referendum? Well, I wouldn't expect uh, the European Commission or any of the institutions or member states to uh, intervene in that debate, just as I wouldn't intervene in the internal debates of, of another member state. But I do certainly detect a shift of attitude from the one that prevailed in 2014 when Scotland uh, considered independence at that time. I think Brexit has probably opened the eyes of many people across Europe to why Scotland would want to be independent and the consequences of us, for us of not being independent, but also what Scotland as you know, a country that has demonstrated in the last few years that it wants to be a European nation, the benefits that that would bring, not just to Scotland, but to Europe as well. So I detect a, a warm response for Scotland when I pay visits like this one to Brussels. You've recently said that you intend to hold a second Scottish independence referendum into the second half of 2020. Do you think the scenario of a hard Brexit makes the case for Scottish independence a lot more feasible? Um, I think Scotland should have the choice of independence, uh, whether there's a, a no-deal Brexit or a hard Brexit. Scotland didn't vote for any Brexit and I, I think we have to have the option of being an independent country and continuing to play our part in the European Union on that basis. But there's no doubt the harder the Brexit and particularly the car crash that a no-deal Brexit would be will, I think, lead many people in Scotland to consider that independence is not just desirable, but it has become more urgent to protect ourselves from the damage that a no-deal Brexit would do, not just in the short term, but in the long term to our economy, to our social cohesion, to the opportunities that future generations have to travel freely across the European continent. Uh, so there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that that scenario would increase uh, the, uh, the likelihood of Scotland becoming independent. By extension, therefore, do you think Scottish independence could be justified further with Boris Johnson as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? No, I think the key to Scottish independence is a majority of people in Scotland confidently deciding that we should be an independent country. That's always been, uh, in my view, what will lead to Scotland becoming independent. Uh, Brexit, the prospect of not just Boris Johnson, but any of these hardline Brexiteers being Prime Minister will undoubtedly, I think, um, further illustrate the divergent paths politically that Scotland and the rest of the UK are on. And will demonstrate the the argument for and the benefits of being in charge of our own destiny as a country rather than having that imposed upon us by somebody like Boris Johnson. If the UK eventually ends up remaining a member of the European Union, how much damage does this do to the case for Scottish independence? I hope the UK does remain in the European Union and I will continue on that basis to make the, the positive case for Scotland being an independent country alongside the rest of the UK as members of the European uh, Union. Uh, as we have been talking about a moment ago, uh, we see not just on Brexit but on many other issues, uh, the UK, other parts of the UK and Scotland perhaps being on different paths and I think the argument for Scotland becoming independent, not as, like Brexit is, uh, an expression of isolationism, but actually as an expression of our desire to be a, a modern, progressive, European country in the best traditions of uh, modern, progressive European countries, I think that argument uh, continues and will continue to gather strength. How much is a Remain coalition in Westminster being held back by Jeremy Corbyn's unwillingness to adopt a stance on Brexit? Well, Jeremy Corbyn is the roadblock barrier 
to building a coalition behind a, a second referendum. There is no doubt about that. If the UK crashes out of the EU with no deal at the end of October, well, primary responsibility for that lies with the Conservatives and those who advocated Brexit. But, you know, not far behind, there will be Jeremy Corbyn, whose prevarication will have made it harder to avoid that outcome. Um, so I hope that we see Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party finally come off the fence and get behind a second referendum. But, you know, it remains to be seen whether they will do that. But I think history will harsh, uh, judge them very harshly if they don't and the UK suffers considerably as a result. What message do you have for the 62% of Scottish voters who voted to remain in the European Union in 2016? And also, do you have a message for those Scottish citizens who are currently residing on the continent? Well, in terms of Scotland, Scotland has demonstrated, uh, not just in the Brexit referendum, but again in the European Parliament elections, that we are a pro-European country. We don't want Brexit, we want to stay at the heart of Europe. Uh, Remain supporting parties in the European Parliament elections, got more than 60% of the vote in Scotland. My party won 50% of the seats. We got a higher percentage of the vote in Scotland than the Brexit party got across the UK. So Scotland has made very clear where it stands on the European question. And my job as uh, the First Minister of Scotland is to represent that and to do everything I can to make sure that Scotland's democratically expressed wishes on this matter are upheld, and I will continue to do that. And to Scots living across Europe, uh, we want to protect your ability to live and work and study freely across Europe, just as we want to protect those from other European countries who live in Scotland, who make a, a fantastic contribution to our country, and we want them to stay there and feel welcome there. And I will do everything I can to protect that. Let's imagine the UK has already left the European Union. How do you map out Scotland's path back into the bloc? Well, some of the detail of that, of course, depends on what the final uh, outcome for the UK is. And uh, in the absence of knowing that, some of this discussion becomes quite speculative and, and hypothetical. But I, uh, whatever that path turns out to be, and I am not uh, trying to suggest that there will be no tough discussions to have there and th th Scotland will require, like all member states do, to demonstrate that it's willing not just to take the benefits of EU membership but live up to the responsibilities as well. But I think that path back, uh, I think it is inconceivable that that path doesn't end with Scotland being warmly welcomed as an independent member of the European Union. And uh, I'm I was confident of that in 2014, but I'm even more confident of that today. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very so much. much. Appreciate it.